Um, what did it say about screen sharing for you there, Warren? So right now it just says host disabled participant screen sharing is what it's okay. That middle button there that says share screen. Mm -hmm. It's gonna kind of go over some slides if possible. Um did that fix it? Yes. Awesome. Okay. All right. So that can you all see the main presentation mode screen? Does that show up there, Andrew? Yes. All right. At any point in time, it has fits or whatever, let me know. But I'm going to go through this and um, feel free to type uh, whatever questions you might have. I'll answer the best of my ability. Um, and Andrew will be able to read them to me at the end. So. But no, thanks again. I appreciate you all having me here this, this afternoon, evening. I don't know what time it is in your neck of the woods. Um, I'm on fast time here. I, let's see here. Yep. Okay. So a little bit about me. I live in Western Pennsylvania. I'm in Evans City, PA. My wife and I, Grace Orwell, uh, we have an 80 acre cow calf operation where we sell a couple commercial cows, some registered Angus females and bulls. And we do a little local freezer beef. Uh, we both graduated uh, with animal science degrees from Penn State University. Um, so I'm, I, I tell folks I, I'm not a PhD. My roots are planted in sales, um, but I like to think that when I go to the farm beat and I deal and work with customers such as yourselves, I'm looking to find solutions to problems or ways that I can help make operations better through the products that we provide. Um, so I guess my official title is sales specialist, but uh, pre animal nutrition is a part of Land Lakes, which is a farmer cooperative, which I'm pretty proud to be a part of that. And basically there's companies such as Truterra Sustainability Company, uh, Winfield Ags or Agronomy Division. And then obviously on Land Lakes, like the Dairy Solutions is all part of the same, under the same umbrella of Land Lakes, and pre animal nutrition is under that umbrella as well. Um, but what's unique about that is we do a lot of research. So the, the main thing that I do when I go to the farm gate, the products that I provide are all research backed. So some of the things that we'll go over um, is some of the research that we've done. Um, but there at the bottom right, you can see it's our large animal metabolism unit. This is um, a research facility that's located just west of St. Louis, Missouri in Gray Summit. Um, I'm sure you've all seen cannulated cows, but this is where we can actually study um, how different feeds are digested in the rumen. Uh, we even have on the top right, artificial rumens that we make um, to kind of better understand the microbial population, how microbes play a role in overall digestion. And then on the top left, you can see there's some of our feed scales, which are Kalen, we call them Kalen gates. They're basically help to measure the eating behavior of the cattle They'll scan the, the ear tag. They'll know how long that cow's been eaten, how much it's ate, how frequent the meals are, um, everything, because a lot of our feed, our AccuRational products are centered around um, eating behavior and modifying that eating behavior through the feed products, whether it's looking at the body, volatile fatty acid profile, fats, salts, you know, you name it. Um, different factors play a role in what modifies eating behavior. So that's something that we study closely. Uh, but what I'm proud of is that I think that we're on the forefront of a lot of these um, in the industry as far as developing a lot of the technology that's going into feeds today to help um, cattle be more and more productive. Um, so that's whether looking at prebiotics to help uh, minimize the amount of antibiotic use or what have you, we're, we're all, always looking at new things. And so when I go to the farm gate, I actually collect a lot of this data and I help reward customers and give them some money off their feed. And I submit that data to the research facility. So in a lot of ways, we have a lot of data points on our products because there's folks like me all around the country um, collecting them. And I will go over a couple of things that we're doing such as our, our mineral intake trials and things like that. But that's just a little bit of background information about the, the pre and animal nutrition center in Grace Summit. So a couple of things that I thought were fitting for this time of year that I, I think would be beneficial is to kind of look at the impact of a balanced mineral program, uh, then look at body condition scoring and how that affects overall conception rates in cattle, and then also some grazing considerations for the spring. 
So when you look at what mineral does, I'm not gonna go through everything here, but the main thing to take home is mineral plays a role in just about every facet of um, a cow's life. So whether it's an immune function or fertility or even hair coat, uh, macro minerals, micro minerals, they all play an important role. The one that I wanna focus on a little bit more closely is fetal development and overall um, fertility. So the red minerals are our micro minerals, such as zinc, copper, manganese, and we'll go over the products that we have and why we have them and how they affect the cow um, with fetal development overall um, conception rates of fertility and productivity in that respect. So I see this a lot when I go to farm gates and I'll be guilty of it as well is the, the red blocks and you know that they'll serve a purpose, they provide salt uh, to the cow. But as far as an overall mineral program, for year-round nutrition, it's not really, that's not really the best approach. If you're feeding a complete feed or a mixed ration with some mineral already in it, then this is fine. You, that will help provide salt. I feed this to my steers with, uh, but they also get a, a pellet that has all the mineral in it. So from a salt standpoint, this is okay. But if you think you're covering all the bases with uh, like a red block or trace mineral block, um, I hate to break it to you, but I think there might be some things that you might want to look into. So when you look at a mineral program, what do we look at that's important? Uh, the first thing is the cattle need mineral, right? So I'm sure a lot of you are calling, come, you know, dialing in from different parts of the country. So different forages, different environmental factors, there's supplementation needed because forage isn't going to have all the vitamins and minerals that cattle need. Um, the other part is, the cow's got to eat it, right? So if a cow's not going to eat it and it's not palatable, then there's no sense in spending the money and putting it out there. Uh, but you want a product that's going to be consistent. It's um, predictable. And we have products that are weather resistant to keep that palatability year round. And then finally, you want to find the correct mineral. Now, I don't care um, if you're feeding Prater or not, or if you're feeding Neutrina or whatever product you're feeding, you got to find the right fit that fits your needs for what you're doing. So when you look at what are the factors that are affecting the overall consumption of this mineral, um, salt content is one of them. But mineral, um, excuse me, phosphorus and magnesium are probably the two most unpalatable um, minerals that you can find in a pack, and that will affect the overall palatability. But the form of the product, so we found that cattle tend to like coarser uh, products over more of a salt type mineral. So we use a meal type mineral and then feeder location. So I always tell folks, look at where you're putting your mineral. Uh, set it next to a loafing area or water source where the cattle are gonna be um, periodically. And then also deficiencies in other nutrients in the diet. And then finally, forage quality, other supplementation. So we look at the digestibility of forages. So as digestibility goes up, you start to see mineral intake go down. And I know that some of you are turning your cows out on pasture right now, and you might notice the mineral intake, you know, might drop a little bit um, and that's normal, you know? And so conversely, you bring them back and the, give them, hey, I've noticed sometimes my cattle will uptick in the amount of mineral they're eating. So things like that will also affect overall consumption. But let's look at what happens if you're not feeding supplemental mineral supplemental mineral. So to me, it's, it's a domino effect, right? The overall name of the game with most beef operations is you're trying to, you get paid on pounds. So if you're offering something that doesn't have good fortification or the right mineral can lead to poor immunity, increased amounts of sickness, smaller, weaker calves, reduce later conception. So if your conception rates are affected and those cows aren't calving at the right time, but you're selling them um, the same month as you always do, they're going to be lighter overall. Think about what, you know, 50 pounds of calf weight on today's feeder market is going to affect your bottom line. So conception rate plays a big role there. Decreased milk production and then overall decreased weaning weights. So like I said, um, we look at trying to get four ounce per head per day. This is the mineral trials that we've done. And between 2012 and 19, we did about 145,000 cows. They averaged just a tick higher than four ounces per head per day, 
but that's what we strive for in our bag of minerals. So a lot of different minerals fit the needs. The main one that, you know, being this time of year is you're looking at high mag mineral. A lot of people are feeding this right now because we're getting that lush spring uh, growth. Uh, you also have concerns with that with grass tetany, um, something that can be kind of scary depending on what your environment's like and what kind of cows you're feeding. Um, the best way to avoid it is prevention. So it's a scary thing that can kind of sneak up on you. And once it starts happening, it's usually too late. But in ways that you can avoid it is put a high bag mineral out two to three weeks before turnout through 60 days after that lush growth. When you think of the cows that are affected most by grass tetany, they're usually that those high heavier milkers uh, because that magnesium in the milk, um, there's gonna be the same level of magnesium in the milk no matter how much that cow's milking. So if she's milking a lot, it's gonna affect her even more and uh, deplete her stores of magnesium. So if you think of it, you wanna turn your cows out, maybe focus earlier on on your dry cows or your younger cows, uh, the ones that are, um, Cows in earlier lactation need two to four times the amount of magnesium. Also look at what kind of grass do you have out there. If you're someone that just has native forages um, versus somebody that maybe plants legumes such as clovers, red clovers, or, or alfalfa, there tends to be a little bit more magnesium in those forages. and They might be a little bit safer to expose the cows on. And then what you're fertilizing your pastures with. So if you're using a lot of nitrogen or potassium, those are things that are tying up the magnesium and the rumen and that they'll be more detrimental in this case. So just some things to keep in mind. And then we're getting into fly season, right? So a lot of you are already noticing the flies um, hatching and coming out and we're getting into that time of year. And a lot of times those times of year overlap with the high mag. So we saw a lot of the high mag with fly control this time of year for that reason. But it's something that costs our industry a lot of money in overall uh, performance. So when you look at a billion dollars annually, that's because our weaning weights are lighter and yearling weights are lighter. Um, the the horn flies are the big blood suckers, and that's what Alptacid uh, is what it's targeting. And it's a it's a population control more than anything. But if it can affect your uh, yearling weights by 33 pounds and your weaning weights by 20, you know, based on what kind of feeder prices we're getting right now which I don't know are gonna hold forever, but that's quite a bit of chunk of change that you're leaving on the table. But the Altacid, the way that works, there's no additional labor. And I always tell folks, use this in conjunction with your current practices for fly control. So if you're using porons or fly tags, silence, sidectin, what have you, you can use this in conjunction with it. It's perfectly safe to feed. It's not actually absorbed into the bloodstream of the cow but rather it's going into the manure. The horned flies will target the undisturbed patties that are out in the pasture. They lay their eggs and then those eggs aren't able to develop. And so it's low stress on cattle and it doesn't build any kind of resistance year over year. Um, what I'll tell you is if you're raising cows on a dry lot situation through the summer or in confinement, um, you don't need to feed this mineral. It'd be really a waste of money, more or less, because if those cows, they will, the flies will only lay in undisturbed patties. So um, in confinement situations, it's not the case. So like, if you look at when, okay, when should I start feeding fly control mineral? So we go the 30-30 rule is what we go by. So 30 days before the last killing frost in the spring through 30 days after the first frost in the fall. And I see a lot of folks kind of pulling out of the fly control mineral a little too early. And what you'll what will happen is, excuse me, you'll have the fall and spring some more residual flies coming back that were dormant through the winter. So that laid their eggs there after that uh, you stopped the fly control mineral. So just something to keep in mind there. So a little bit of cowboy math, the way I figure it, this is based off of some earlier feeder prices, but if it costs you four cents per head per day to add the Altacid pack to your fly mineral and you figure fly season is about 210 days, it's costing you $8.40. And when you convert that to weaning weight, it's, it's at least a five to one return on your investment. And then finally, we have a, a pro cycle mineral. So this is a lot of, there's a lot of other minerals out there that have similar features 
such as Vitafirm. This is our Purifirm Protocycle Mineral, which Purifirm is an enzyme that helps basically get more energy out of your less digestible forages. And then those have Archelated Mineral Pack, which I'm going to go over here now. This is kind of goes around that whole fertility talk the zinc, manganese, cobalt, and copper. And that's Avela 4. So Avela 4 is made by Zimpro, and that's a pack that we put in a lot of our mineral. Um, but the way I look at it is the Avela 4 is a chelated mineral that helps with reproduction and that it offers shorter breeding intervals and helps fertility. It helps with vaccination responses for herd health and overall better colostrum. And if you have better colostrum that you're offering your calves, that's gonna help bring better weaning weights, healthier calves overall. So it has a domino effect of um, overall importance and benefits. But any kind of chelated mineral, this is the way it works. And a lot of folks say, well, why should I feed it? What's the importance of the veil for? Is it's basically more readily available because they combine those minerals, the copper, manganese, zinc, and cobalt with amino acid transporters. Sometimes when a cow eats a mineral, based on where they're at in their environment, there might be antagonists such as fiber if they're feeding a very um, mature, less digestible hay, or if their water has high sulfur content, those are the things that are gonna bind up those micro minerals that are used to help benefit the cow's overall fertility and health. So what we do is we combine them with these amino acid transporters, they make them more metabolically available to where they're needed most. So basically you can get into the bloodstream more readily. So this is a slide that I like to show customers um, because it, it really resonates with me. When you think of when a cow has a calf, we always want that calf to be up and nursing within two hours, right? Um, so when you look at what the benefit of the Avela 4 mineral is, a calf has a limited amount of brown fat. And what happens is that brown fat metabolizes into white fat. And the main catalyst that sets that wheel in motion is copper. And so that's how that calf can generate heat. So we think about what the thermoneutral zone is in a calf. That's 50 degrees to 77 degrees. And we think we're out of the woods right now. Some of you might still be calving or it might be fall calving, what have you. 50 degrees isn't very cold, but anything below that, that calf is tapping into their energy stores to stay warm. So there's something to keep in mind. And really the only way that calf is gonna get the copper it needs to metabolize that brown fat is through the liver stores and the mom through passive transfer of the milk. So that's why when you're feeding the veil for mineral to a cow, you're trying to help uptick the liver stores of copper to make sure that calf is gonna be able to be fortified once it hits the ground during colder weather. And I know it's, this is something that I show at my mineral meetings in the winter time, but to me, it's still pretty crucial even this time of year. So again, a little bit of cowboy math I look at. If you're, for those of you that are feeding, or I'm sorry, um, you doing AI, maybe you're doing embryo transfer, some ET work, or you're looking at reaching full genetic potential in the herd. To me, if it's costing you $5 a bag, for the add-on of available for mineral, it's cost you about $9.13 per head per year. And that's 365 days a year. And I'm not saying you have to do it 365 days a year because I have a lot of customers that are just doing it 30 days pre-calving and then through breeding season, and it's still gonna have overall benefits, but that's what it's costing you. And I kind of put it in terms of, okay, if I'm breeding cows and I'm spending money on semen, I'm spending money on everything from loot to seed, uh, cedars, GNRH, and maybe additional labor, or maybe I got bulls at home and I'm feeding with bulls, you still, they still cost you money, right? So if I buy one pack of cedars, I could feed 15 cows on that available for mineral for a year. To me, that's, that's pretty cheap insurance and can help my, if it means it can help my conception rates even a little bit, I'm probably gonna do it, especially if you have the value added cattle that you're trying to market. Or maybe you think of when you run a cow through a chute, you put one dose of ivermectin on that same cow you could feed well, based off that one dose a year on um, available for mineral. And then we don't want to forget about this guy too. So I know he's the wrong color for the crowd I'm talking to, but at the end of the day, the concept's still the same. Um, sperm motility is important and overall conception rates and some of the data that we've collected from the University of Nebraska has shown that those Zen Pro packs with the available mineral helps with overall sperm motility um, 
which in turn will help your overall conception rates. So as we shift gears here, you know, I I like to show people and talk to them when I go to the farm gate, you know, a lot of people don't think of it in terms of this, but when you look at your cow herd, a lot of those cows are eating for two or three. Um, when a cow's getting bred, or I'm sorry, when a cow calves, we like to see that 45 day window, right, where she's getting rebred back. But 85 days is kind of the max. You don't really want to get too far off that 85 day rebreed. But during that time, she's lactating and nursing. And then one after she's bred, you know, through the summer, especially if she's a two year old, she hasn't reached her mature weight yet. So she's still growing. So she's either pregnant, nursing, pregnant and nursing, or she's going to be called. So there's a lot, you know, it's, it's a hard life to be a productive brood cow. And so the things that we got to look at is not only just the mineral, but the body condition of those cows and how that affects productivity and conception rates and things like that. Um, so if we look at body condition scores of cows and you're looking to breed cows here this uh, spring, summer, um, it's good to look now, see what your cows are doing out in the pasture if they need additional fortification. Um, the research that we've looked at has shown that cows that are getting bred pregnant by day 40, 90, um, body condition score six cows, excuse me, have a conception rate of 90% of being 90% of them are being bred before day 40. I worded that poorly, I apologize. The cows that are body condition score five are getting 65% um, of the time they're getting bred back before day 40 and then only 43% of the body condition score four cows are getting back, bred back by day 40. So when we look at body condition scoring, um, I go out and I, I work with customers and we look at all the cow herd and we kind of come up with an overall average. But the way we score them is between a three and an eight, a three being emaciatingly thin, an eight being extremely obese. And so you don't want to be on either end of the spectrum, but rather somewhere in the middle, right? So if we're looking at uh, post calving, uh, you want to go into calving season on a six because after she starts lactating, she's going to come down a little bit. Um, but that's the time to really assess where you're at before breeding season because you want to give yourself enough time. If you, I mean, everybody knows what feed prices are doing right now. I mean, uh, corn prices and everything else, it's all costly. So if your cow right now is at a three and a half body condition score, she needs to put on at least three pounds of gain a day to reach that five and a half at rebreeding. That's not going to come, that's going to come at a cost. It's not going to be cheap. Um, and then let's look at that first time heifer again. So if, if that first time heifer is like 75, 80% of a mature body weight, and she's a five at calving season, what do you think is going to happen when she gets turned out on pasture? In the summer slump of summer, when the forages start to go down, her condition is going to drop. So if you can do her, um, you know, it, do yourself a favor and make sure she's at least a six going into um, five and a half to a six going into uh, breeding season. So this is a chart here that goes over what we look at and from a scale from three to eight, um, we're looking at overall fat deposition and the amount of muscle that a cow has. So again, we're looking at a six is the goal. That is the gold standard pre-calving. We want them to be, and I'm a very visual person. So I thought it'd be fitting to kind of go through this. Uh, so that way, when you see cows out in the field, you can associate it with what you think their body condition score is. So when you look at a body condition score three cow, all the ribs are visible. All the, not only is the backbone visible, but each individual vertebrae. Uh, obviously, no tailhead fat or no brisket fat. And you can see there's some significant muscle loss in that quarter and between her hooks and pins. Um, you know, I'll say this. I know the longhorn cattle is a different breed than you know, a lot of the different cattle that, that I see on day to day, but the concept transfers. It, it's the same idea. So it's, you're still looking for the same thing. They may not have the same muscle expression as some of the um, continental breeds and things like that, but um, you'll still be able to notice that looking at them. I mean, you guys all have a more trained eye than I do when it comes to that breed, but do you want to look at these points here on that cow to see how that fat deposition looks? And so when you look at a three and a half to a four, you're pretty much at the same point, maybe a little bit smoother cover, 
a little bit less muscle loss, but you can still see um, on the top of that spine, both sides are atrophied. You might not see each individual vertebrae, but there's definitely some atrophy. And that's a four there, so a little bit of more muscle. You can see a little bit more progress there. This is to me where you can start to see um, really some difference. So the first two ribs are gonna be covered, but the last four or five are gonna be visible in the cow on a body condition score of four and a half. Tail head fat, there's still none there, really still clean fronted, not much brisket fat. And you'd like to see a little bit more muscle on that cow to be honest. And then a four and a half to a five. So you're getting a little bit more muscle. Only two to three ribs are visible. So this is what, what a five look like. You'd like to see maybe a little bit better muscle, but there's still some better muscle there than what some of the threes and fours have been. Angular in her backbone, not as much atrophy, but just more angular over down over her top. Not much brisket fat. Here's another five. So when you think of during the breeding season, you're going to pull those calves off. This is the target at weaning. So when you pull those calves off their mom and whether that's the time you run them through the shoot and vaccinate them, blood test them, preg check them, whatever, you want them to look like this or at least um, have the same degree of muscle and, and adipose to them. Here's a five, five and a half. Still angular in the backbone, one visible rib. Muscles, pretty good. There's another five and a half here. So this would be your target whenever you're putting those cows in for to get bread when the bull's going into the pasture, five and a half. So we said, what, six is pre-calving goal. See, there's a big difference there. Muscle looks good, very smooth pattern, no visible ribs, round over her top, a little bit of brisket and tail fat, not too much. Target of calving. Here's another one. No ribs visible, nice round over top. Good muscling between her hooks and pins and down her through her lower quarter. Now we're starting to go the other direction, right? So then you get the ones that are getting a little bit more fat around their tail head. You can see they're a little bit wastier fronted. They're starting to get square across the top. Um, the backbone's not visible, no visible ribs. Here's a seven. Again, square over top, just a heavier degree of fat in their elbow pockets, back of their tail head. Um, good flesh overall. The brisket fat is where it starts to get excessive. You can see down into our lower twist and around the tail head here, especially a better view, um, how that fat's getting laid in a little too heavy. And I didn't have a picture of an eight. I think I have, a, have an eight back behind the house here that I'm not too proud of. And she's getting a new zip code next week, but those cows, they basically look like a walking briefcase. They're completely square. <laughs> Um, you can't really make out any kind of ribs. Um, brisket fat's distended almost like you could like, they have a step in their brisket, like you could step on it, it's so big. So what happens is you start to break down tag numbers and tally marks to the body condition score. And then you can start coming up with averages and percentage to know where the overall cow hit herd is. And if you're hitting the goals that you wanna hit. So when you look at body condition again at calving, we wanna be at six. Both cows and first calf heifers, the bulls, when you turn them in, you want him to be at a six. Nice smooth pattern, no visible ribs. Cows, five and a half to a six um, uh, breeding time. Granted, you know, she's going to be lactating between calving and turn in, so she might come down a little bit in body condition. And then weaning time, you want to try to stay above the five. So the next part I, I wanted to go over is nutrient partitioning. So how is it in relative um, order of importance when a cow is got grazing and trying to get as much nutrients into her as possible, where do those nutrients go? Where does the energy grow go? So in order of importance, we look at basal metabolism, activity, growth, energy reserves, pregnancy, lactation, additional energy reserves. And then finally, at number eight is estrus cycles and initiation of pregnancy. So when you think of a cow that's eating or nursing her calf, she's trying to reach her mature body weight, she's eating for a basal metabolism, um, maybe she's trying to maintain pregnancy, uh, milking, 
those are all coming before estrous cycles initiation of pregnancy. So it's something to consider when you're trying to keep uh, good conception rates is those cows have to be in good condition. And what happens is um, the thing that I thought was a timely topic is we're turning these cows out on the pasture. So the thing to keep in mind that we forget in this industry is those cows are gonna act differently when you turn them out on pasture, especially if they're calves that maybe all they've known is a dry lot and some hay. Maybe they've only been hand fed ever in their whole life. Well, what happens is we have these naive grazers that go through what we call pasture crash. So if you look at that chart there, it shows what average daily gain of heifers that are weaned and develop on range compared to heifers that are weaned and develop on dry lot. They're all put onto the pasture at the same time. You can see what happens in that first week is the cows that were, or the calves that were raised on the dry lot go backwards. That average daily gain is going backwards. So you're not doing that calf any favor, especially if that's a yearling or a 14 month old heifer that you're trying to breed. Um, it's not gonna be a good deal for you. So something to consider and what we'll talk about is kind of how to manage around that. So environmental change and heifer activity. So what we look at, and Dr. Perry, and I, I talked to Dr. Gunn um, about this a little bit because he's the one that kind of gave me these slides here on this matter. And I thought it was pretty interesting um, that when you look at the daily activity of a calf on pasture versus a calf on dry lot, and they're both put on pasture, that one that's maybe been 44 days on pasture, she knows how to eat and graze. She's used to knowing what her requirements are and she's gonna walk more. She's gonna put more steps per day to maintain that average daily gain in that overall condition. But that calf that's been on the dry lot and knows that you're bringing a bale out to her every day, she's not gonna know what to do. And those average steps per day go down. And not only that, but we have to think of the time of year that we're putting them out. So I put this picture on the screen and um, I kind of tell folks, you know what manure looks like when you turn them out this time of year. It's so, it's so watery that you can shoot it through a screen and not hit a single wire. And so when you think of that, how much water's in that manure, how much of those nutrients are really being absorbed when that, path, when that rate of passage is so high in that spring lush grass. So the South Dakota State study, heifers that are placed on pasture, pasture immediately following time to AI lost nearly a pound and a half per day during the first week on grass. So not only are those that forage not being absorbed and those calories really are just going out the back end, but that calf doesn't really know how to graze properly. So that's what's causing that average daily gain to start going in the other direction. So you're not doing any favors there um, by taking a calf that's been on dry lot and then you want to breed it, but you put it on pasture, um, it'll be detrimental. So when you look at your experienced grazers versus your naive grazers and the ones that have been on the dry lot, you can see a 10% difference in overall conception rates um, with bred AI. Also, you've got to consider how much can they eat. So mature cows, they might eat 60 to 70 bites per minute or eight hours per day, and that converts to about 130 pounds as is. Those are your experienced grazers. Your less experienced grazers and younger cows are going to eat 20 to 40 percent less, and they are, they're the ones that require more energy, a protein-dense diet. So both the high moisture content early in the season and higher fiber late can be limiting for that calf. So some things to keep out, keep in mind when you're going to turn them out here this spring um, that maybe look at when you're breeding them and when you're turning them out is the important thing. That's kind of the, the thing that I want you to think about. Um, so tips and ways that you can help when turning them out is offer good quality hay, dry round bale. It could be just good first cut hay for the first few weeks of the grazing season or until that grass hardens up. Uh, you don't want to use your best alfalfa. Again, alfalfa is very digestible forage. You're not going to really benefit anything there. Those proteins are just going to shoot right through it. But something that is going to help bind up that calf a little bit more that slows down that rate of passage. So um, place the hay somewhere near a water source or somewhere you know, where you know those cows are going to pass the hay where they can take a few bites. Something that's palatable where they want to take a few bites. But by slowing down that rate of passage, you're getting those microbes to digest that, those proteins and those energy more adequately. So you're giving more calories to that cow. Also think about when you're AI too. So what I would say is either look at breeding your cows and then wait 
if they're on confinement or on a dry lot, you breed them, wait three weeks or so before turning them out and get them acclimated, or you can look at acclimating to the grass before breeding. So if you're already on pasture now, give them at least 45 days to kind of get acclimated to that grass, put a little bit of hay out there to kind of slow down that rate of passage so that they're not crashing and going backwards in overall body condition. You know, so that's, I mean, we talked about how conditions affect them. So those are just some things to think about. Now, like I said, I'm, you know, I'm not a PhD by any means. I work with a nutritionist there at the research farm and they have a wealth of knowledge. So as we go through this and at the end here, anybody has any questions or wants some resources sent to them, I'm more than happy to do that. But overall, I hope that, you know, this kind of gives you an idea on how to set up or implement in an all season mineral program to kind of look at what you're doing now and if there's things that maybe you might need to do differently. Um, look at the body condition of your cows, just walk through them, you know, write down some notes uh, to keep in check for breeding season, going into breeding season. So this is kind of a crucial time to look at that. And then be conscious of turnout time on pasture and when you're breeding, when you're, um, maybe you're doing some ET work. So those are some things to kind of look at as we go through the spring and going into summer that I thought were timely topics. So. Um, with that, that is pretty much what I had that I wanted to go over. So I'm happy to answer any questions. So the horn fly, let's see, there's a question here I just opened here, Andrew. Um, the horn fly is located on the animal. A lot of times um, they're gonna go from the, pretty much on the top lines where you're gonna mostly notice them. Um, what, I, what I will say is, the uh, the horn flies they don't have very big wings, so they go from the top of the cow to the manure patty, lay their eggs, and they keep going back and forth. But they're the big blood suckers. Uh, we did some trials there last summer where we actually had um, an algorithm on our phone that we could count the amount of flies on a cow's back to better understand if our fly control mineral is working. But when we look at where those flies are located, and from what I've seen is I'm seeing them mostly on the top line of the cow. Um, and some on the side, but that's that's where the heaviest concentration is going to be. All right. Um, so I had a question. Uh, I think that's the only one that's popped up in the Q and A here. So I was just going to ask uh, if folks want to maybe step up their mineral program or um, uh, better understand it. Um, what's a good resource? You know, I know you can't be everywhere, so. What can folks do to uh, learn more about this? Uh, yeah, so my info is on the page here. I, I'm happy to, to get people pointed in the right direction, but really if you go to prenamills.com, find a dealer locator and find where your closest Prina, independent Prina dealer, not your tractor supplies. But the, what I do is I support the independent dealers, the co-ops um, in my neck of the woods, the Agway stores, and I work with Heritage Co-op in Ohio as well. But if you know the independent dealers, we all are assigned to them. So we will be more familiar with the products that are more specific to your area. So we sell a lot of the 7.5% phosphorus mineral in my area. Um, but there's some areas where there might be different phosphorus requirements. Um, there might be some areas where you feed high mag mineral year round. So we have access to plants where the most popular minerals are being sold out of Evansville, Ohio. And so those are the minerals that we sell the most in our area. But what I can tell you is uh, there's usually a sales specialist assigned to your location. So if you don't know who that is, you can reach out to me. Uh, you can go on a Prina Mills website. I think there's a customer service that you can uh, email them as well. And they forward it to us. They, they find the right channels and forward it to us and say, hey, you got a customer in North Carolina or Maryland, and they're looking for some guidance on a mineral program. And then we contact you directly. So, so there's a couple different ways you could do that. Got you. Um, and I guess I'll just say, um, since we are the TLBAA, um, you know, we're all Longhorn folks. So is there anything, if you go on to a, a Longhorn ranch that you're going to uh, look at differently um, than if you were to go on, uh, what do you call it, continental breeds <laughs> ranch? Yeah, so like, I think the thing that I'm, I'm not as familiar with, and I guess when I walk 
when I get to learn a little bit more about your operations, and I, I know Jeremy's in my area, and I've worked with him in the past, sometimes your goals might be a little bit different than what the average cattle producer is going to be. If you're selling um, genetics, you know, you you might be looking at different times of the year that you're calving, different times that you're going to be body condition scoring your cows. Um, as far as mineral requirements, I don't know that there really is anything that's going to be majorly different in terms of mineral. It's going to be uh, converted the same, but as we were looking at the body condition score, I think the, the longhorn cattle, they just, they're, they're kind of a different type and kind to them. They're a different makeup, but where they're going to put on fat and condition is going to be the same as any other breed of cattle. So it's the, the same mindset. It's just, they have a different look to them, but I think uh, your mineral program is also going to go around what your overall goals are as a producer. I'm not going to go to a farm that raises feeder calves to the auction and push our $60 a bag mineral um, because it's not going to be feasible for them, but to the guy that's raising seed stock bulls or, you know, cows where you're trying to get some good embryos or you're selling embryos out of them, doing some ET work, pro cycle make, make more sense, especially if your forages are marginal. So those are the things that I kind of look at a little bit closer, more specific than just the breed, but um, the, the longhorns, I know it's a, it's a pretty interesting industry and uh, I feel like I'm always learning when I go out to a farm and, and seeing them, but, uh, but it's going to be the same concept, just I think more environmental differences, so. All right, Warren, well, we really appreciate you uh, coming on here today and talking with us. I uh, appreciate your, your time. Um, yep, um, so if that's all the questions I guess I have for this one. If nobody else has any questions, then we can go ahead and, uh, and close it out. Um, I do believe that I got this recorded, um, so I will, hopefully be able to get that up on the TLBAA beef tab um, for folks who might have missed it to watch it uh, later. Um, I will work on that. And um, our next one uh, will be next quarter. Uh, we don't have an exact date for it, but the beef committee will work on that and uh, get that next one out. And it's going to be on processing uh, cattle and, um, you know, butchering and and all that so thank you everybody for joining and we will see you on the next one thanks thank you all again bye